Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the worship of God. I am glad that you are here with us and that you have come to join us for this very special day. I hope you are faring well through this struggle that we are having right now. I know that it is not easy to shelter in place and I know that it is not easy to keep social distance. It certainly is not easy when you're an extrovert like me and so I pray for you as you deal with these issues and I covet your prayers as well. There's a lot that's going on in our country and in our world right now and I hope that you are spending time in prayer about all of it. I thank you for joining us here today for live stream worship from Blacksburg Baptist Church. This is a good time for us to be able to gather together and celebrate even if we are not gathering the way that we would like to. This is Palm Sunday. It's the day that we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It begins Holy Week. It is a week when we spend our time thinking about the sacrifice that Jesus made for all of us and it leads to the resurrection a day when we remember how much difference that one day made in the history of the world and the fact that on that day God conquered death and he offers us the best of life. Today we have gathered here to celebrate his presence. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to come here to worship and to celebrate you. Thank you for the love that you have shown our world through Jesus Christ. Help us, O oh Lord, as we gather here to worship, to know what this day was about and to offer our lives to you that we might keep this story moving forward, this wonderful story of life and change. Come to us today, O oh Lord, in the midst of the struggle that is facing the entire world and offer us the best that you have as we try to offer you the best we have. Hear our prayer today, O oh Lord, for it's in your name we offer it. Amen.
We're so glad to be with you today on this Palm Sunday. There is nothing natural about being in this room without you. I'll be honest with you, we've tried to do this twice and I'm struggling. So just be with us. I pray that this will be a wonderful time of worship for you at your homes and you'll join your voices and lift them with ours because we have a blessed assurance that our God is with us every step of the way. days, I'm sure you're focused on a lot of the things that you don't have right now. Maybe you're just missing your friends, which I think we all are, and then being out and about. Maybe you're missing ground beef. I had trouble finding, finding ground beef in the grocery <laughs> store. I had trouble finding ketchup, and we're not even going to talk about the toilet paper and the power, paper towels. But there's one thing that we don't have to look for that is present with us all the way through this, and that is our good, good father. He loves us, he cares for us, and he is watching out for us during this time. He's a good, good father. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I...
reminder that you needed this morning. One more reminder that we have for you. God's love is perfect. He loves us all. He's with us all. And there is nothing more powerful in this world than his love. So take that as your reminder and take that to heart today. God loves you.
Almighty and gracious God, we feel the power of your presence. We know that all of those not with us in the room, but with us by your spirit and with us through technology this morning for which we're grateful. We know that they feel the power of your presence. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that transcends time and space, transcends physical limitations, That's and right. transcends the power of any virus, That's right. the powerlessness of any government. Mm -hmm. God, we are helpless, but we find our help in you. We thank you for the joy of worship. Yes, we thank you that you have made us to worship, knowing that it's good for us and it's glory for you. Yes, and God, I thank you for our family that you've created. I thank you. We thank you for Jesus Christ, with whom we are joint heirs of all that is his, all Father that is yours. Thank you for being such a good, good Father. Thank you for the blessed assurance that Jesus has chosen us and we choosing him, we belong to him. We belong to each other. Thank you for family. Thank you that the enemy and, and anything that the enemy brings is not powerful enough to keep us from being your body on this mm -hmm. earth. Not powerful enough to keep us from worshiping mm -hmm. and gathering in any way that we can. Mm -hmm. And so we rejoice that the enemy's defeated and we are more than conquerors through him who's loved us. Now keep us together. Keep us, Lord, safe. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for healing. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones and friends. And we pray that your spirit would be present and made known in their grief. And God, we look forward to the day that we're all back together. And we can even hug. Until then, thank you that you hold us as we've just sung. Draw us ever nearer to you and nearer and nearer to each other in these days that you might be known in these hard, dark times that your light might shine and the world might say, hey, there's something going on here. I want to know more about that. God, we pray for salvation this very day. For your sake, for your glory, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I've been preaching a sermon series called Easter Upside Down. It's about Jesus and how he took the values of the world and he turned them upside down to make them right side up or to make them look like God always wanted them to be. Last week, we looked at the story of Peter. We talked about how Peter promised Jesus that he was never going to desert him. In fact, he said, even if I have to die with you, I will never leave you. But when the soldiers came to the garden that night and when Jesus wouldn't let them fight, when he wouldn't let the war begin, Peter fell apart because he didn't know what to do. And before the rooster crowed the next morning, Peter had denied that he ever knew Jesus three times. It was exactly what Jesus had said that Peter was going to do. But when Jesus was resurrected from that grave, Jesus went looking for Peter. And he gave Peter three opportunities to say, I love you. And then he called Peter back to the ministry three times. Jesus replaced three denials with six affirmations. It was unconditional love doubled for Peter. The point is, Jesus never gives up on us. Even when we've messed up as badly as we can mess up, Jesus still comes looking for us. He always has a place for us and he always has something for us to do in the kingdom of God. And there is something all of us can do that nobody else can do because we're unique. And so when God calls us, there's something special that he has for us to do. That's the difference in our values and God's values. The world will give up on us we may even give up on the world and we may even give up on God, but God will never give up on us and he will never turn us away from the work that he wants us to do. He always has a place for us if we will accept it and he always has something for us to do for him if we will do it. That's what last week's sermon was about. This week, we're looking at Palm Sunday. 
It was the Sunday when Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It was a magnificent Sunday in many, many ways. The people adored Jesus when he came marching into that town that day until Jesus refused to live the way that they wanted him to live until he refused to live by their values. Our scripture today comes from John 12, 12 through 19. But instead of reading this to you, I would like for you to see what happened that day in color. I want us to watch this video that brings this scripture to life. Let's watch this. Procurator, we have found that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, distorts our people's views on the relationship between God and the state. Furthermore, he perverts the very heart of our religion. I'm not concerned with people who break your religious laws. My function as governor here is to keep the peace and administer Roman justice. We know that, Procurator. But this man also threatens the established order. If he were not a criminal, we would not have brought him to you. He calls himself the Christ, which means the anointed one. Procurator, for us, this man, Jesus, is a blasphemer. If we were a self-governing nation, we would have the right to exact punishment, which under the law of Moses is laid down for blasphemy. He made a triumphal entry into Jerusalem, calling himself the King of the Jews. A claim which we totally reject. No, this man's no criminal. He's a dreamer. Take him away, take him away. Have him flogged as a token of Roman justice. That should wake him up. Right, sir. As a sign of his magnanimity and his benevolence, our divine emperor has decided that the custom of releasing one prisoner sentenced to death in honor of your Passover shall continue. We have two prisoners one, Jesus of Nazareth, accused of treason by proclaiming himself King of the Jews. Do you work a miracle now, Jesus? Call yourself a king? Or 
Barabbas, accused of sedition and murdering a Roman auxiliary. Let's give him the the man that calls the Son of God. Barabbas! He's Barabbas! He's Barabbas! Give us Barabbas! Why don't you free yourself, Jesus? Which of the two shall be released to you? Jesus of Nazareth. We cannot let this happen. We must do Guilty something. Guilty of proclaiming himself king of the Jews. No, he wears a crown. Oh. Barabbas. Barabbas. Free Barabbas. He's a false prophet. He betrayed us. Kill the Nazarene. To be crucified. Release Barabbas now! Release Barabbas in sinners! You cannot kill him! He is innocent! He is innocent! Pilate, I speak your Roman That first Sunday was an exciting day in Jerusalem, but it was also one of the saddest days in history. On Sunday, Jesus was so popular, the Pharisees said, there's nothing we can do. Look, the whole world has gone after him. By Friday, the whole world was screaming for Jesus to die. That might have been the fastest fall from, of support in human history. Jesus went from the hope of the nation to the most hated man in the country in just five days. And the reason that happened is because the people wanted a warrior, but Jesus came to be a peacemaker. It was easy for the people to cheer for Jesus when they thought he was going to do what they wanted him to do, but when they found out the truth, those good religious people turned into a bloodthirsty mob. And at least to me, that's the scariest part of Holy Week. It wasn't the pagans who wanted to, Jesus to die that day. In fact, Pontius Pilate wanted to turn Jesus loose. He knew the man wasn't guilty of anything, but nobody wanted to hear what that pagan Roman governor had to say because the religious people had their minds made up. They thought Jesus had lied to them and they wanted Jesus to die. And if you think that was a one-time thing, you need a history lesson. Last week I talked about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and how he used the strategy of nonviolent resistance during the civil rights movement. Those civil rights marchers never used violence, not a single time from the 1950s through the 1970s. But when Dr. King was assassinated in 1968, White churches all over the South had prayer meetings in response to his murder but most of them were not praying for Dr. King's family and they were not giving thanks for the work that he had done. Those churches met to pray for peace, which means they were praying that the black community wouldn't explode with anger over his assassination. And they prayed that, quote, the country would finally get back to normal, which meant they prayed for segregation to continue because to them, that was normal. 
it was a normal state of life and they wanted to get back to it. Most of us don't like hearing this, but the most adamant defender of slavery and the Jim Crow laws and segregation was the evangelical church. And I hate to say it, but some things haven't changed very much in all of those years. For instance, right now, Africa is the most Christianized continent on the face of the earth because the Christian religion has been growing by leaps and bounds in Africa over the last 40 years. But the problem with that is that the evangelical church, which has been the driver of most of that growth, it's been pushing for laws to make homosexuality a crime in most of the nations of Africa. In some parts of the country, the, the church has actually pushed for the death penalty for homosexuality. In Uganda, which is supposed to be the most Christian nation in Africa, evangelical legislators have pushed through a law that says, or that, that actually gives a 14 year prison sentence to anybody who is accused of homosexuality. And if someone believes their neighbor is a homosexual and they don't report it, they can get seven years in prison. The Christian religion is alive and well in Africa, but I'm not so sure at how well the Christian faith is doing in Africa because true Christian faith does not condone human prejudice and it does not reject human souls because they're different from another one. Friends, you can be baptized, you can go to church every Sunday, you can pray a beautiful prayer, you can raise your hands and shout to the Lord, but being religious doesn't make you a person of peace any more than standing in a pasture makes you a cow. The only thing that makes you a person of peace is the presence of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And in Jesus' case, the religious community went from support and praise to violence and death because Jesus turned out to be a person of peace and that wasn't the kind of Messiah that those people wanted. They wanted power, they wanted strength, they wanted violence, they wanted war, they wanted God's chosen people to be God's only chosen people. They didn't want to hear love your neighbor as yourself. They didn't want to hear love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. They didn't want to hear turn the other cheek. They didn't want a Messiah whose only weapon was going to be God's love. And the cold hearted reality is neither do we. I had someone come to me just a few weeks ago and they asked me if I supported the death penalty. And I said, no, but it's not because I don't want to support the death penalty. I said, it doesn't bother me one bit in this world that Ted Bundy is not in this world. It doesn't bother me that that serial killer is not in the world. In fact, I think the world might be a little safer place without Ted Bundy, but I'm supposed to be a Christ follower. And I haven't found a way yet to read the New Testament and then ask, what would Jesus do? And the answer would be, he'd hang somebody. And until I can do that, I can't support the death penalty. True Christianity is not about our emotions and it's not about how we feel. It's about following Jesus, whether it feels good or not. And following Jesus doesn't always take us where we want to go because what drove Jesus wasn't feelings and it wasn't emotion. It was agape love. It was love in action. Most Christians want to follow Jesus until following Jesus takes us somewhere that we don't want to go. And believe me, it's not usually something big like the death penalty that tends to get us off track. In fact, it can be something as every day as our religion that gets us off track. Go anywhere in the nation this morning 
And you're going to find churches gathered for worship inside their church buildings. It's a stupid thing to do, but they're doing it anyway because some pastors think it's more important for the church to gather in their building for worship than it is to keep people safe from coronavirus. And there are some people who think if they go to church, God will protect them from this virus. Why? Because they have a big dose of bad religion. About a month ago, there was a pastor right here in Virginia who said that this coronavirus thing was a hoax that was invented by the media to make President Trump look bad. And if you were a person of faith, it wasn't going to matter anyway. That guy went to New Orleans on a mission trip because he was, quote, going to drive the sin out of that city. On his way back home, he collapsed in Concord, North Carolina, and he died the next day of coronavirus. If your religion makes you more stupid, then there's something wrong with your religion. If it makes you more judgmental, more hateful, more prejudiced, more narrow-minded, there's a problem with your religion. If your religion makes you think that Jesus would take chances with the health and the well-being of innocent people just so you could gather inside your church building, then you need to take another look at Jesus because I can guarantee you he wouldn't do that. That preacher from here in Virginia, he went to New Orleans on a mission trip. But his mission trip was based on a judgmental attitude. He went to one of the most virus-infected cities in the nation to cast out sin. And then he started home with every intention of meeting with people in worship inside a church building. And he had no concern at all for the fact that he could have infected those people and they could have died. If you think Jesus would do that, then you need to reread Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because the truth of the matter is, if you think that, you may be religious, but you are not following Jesus. There are a lot of religious people who would make great Pharisees. And remember, the Pharisees were very religious people. But Jesus said, by their fruits you will know them. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Jesus knew what the world needed, and it wasn't another dose of hate or religion. What the world needed was a savior from sin, and the Greek word for sin means to miss the mark. It means doing everything from a me point of view. Two weeks ago, a lot of college students came back to Blacksburg, Virginia from spring break. And until the shelter in place rule went into effect this week, a lot of them were having parties together every night. They knew they could get coronavirus and they knew that they could give it to other people. But the quote that has been heard over and over on college campuses across this nation is, that's not our problem, we're just living for now. Jesus didn't do anything from a me point of view. He did everything from a God point of view. Jesus went looking for Peter, even after Peter had denied knowing Jesus three different times. And when Judas showed up with those soldiers to arrest Jesus, when Judas showed up to betray Jesus, Jesus looked at Judas and he said, friend, why are you here? That was Jesus' way of trying to show those men God's unconditional love. He was trying to show everybody how much better the world would be if we all lived according to God's values instead of the world's values. There's a young woman named Lindsay who teaches school in the Bronx in New York City. 
Lindsay grew up in a broken home in Georgia, and she moved to New York City for the adventure and to try to get away from the pain that her family had caused her. But what she didn't know was her job as a school teacher was going to become a ministry of unconditional love to kids who had never even heard of unconditional love, much less experienced it. Let's watch this. When I first moved to New York City, I thought I knew why I was coming here. It was gonna be an adventure, I had my own agenda. I had no idea how much I would fall in love with the kids of the city and how much they would teach me about myself and change my life. I treasure my morning commutes on the subway. It's my time, sometimes it's my only time with God. In those moments, I know his love for me, and I know that that's gonna carry on throughout my day. And I know it's gonna help me to do my job well. The Bronx is one of the toughest neighborhoods in the country. 75% of the people live below the poverty line. And where there's poverty, of course, there's gonna be violence and sadness and strife, ugliness. Right in the middle of the Bronx is Middle School 223, where I'm a reading and writing teacher to sixth graders. It's where I spend my days every day. A lot of our kids at our school go home to shelters. They go home to homes where they are in charge. They see people get shot in front of their apartment door. Life has not been easy for them or kind to them. Morning. Good morning. Hey guys. Thanks for coming in quietly. Many of my students haven't been loved well. They've been abandoned. They've been promised things that have never come. They've been promised relationships with their fathers or mothers that have never happened. And so they're just worn. They're weathered. And they don't trust love. On the first day of school, the first thing that I tell them is, I've been thinking about you all summer. Like, I love you already. You may not believe this, but you can't earn my love. You could make straight A's all year and have perfect behavior all year, or you can get detention three times a week and I'm gonna love you the same. And then I spend all year trying to prove it. So I want you to think back to Monday. We chose that one personal narrative that we're going to publish and celebrate and put out there to the world. Who am I as a person? What do I really want people to know about who I am? Well, it wasn't until recently that I realized that God had been preparing me for this job, for these kids at the school right now. I grew up in Georgia, mostly at my grandmother's house because my mom and dad were divorced. And then when my dad got married, I felt like I wasn't good enough. He, he wanted me to be perfect. I just wasn't good enough anymore. But I know I don't need other people to say I'm okay anymore. I did that my whole life, and I think I'm finally done. So maybe now I can just be Lindsay, and if I make mistakes, then oh well. I'm not only as good as what I do. Growing up, and especially now, even as an adult, I still long for that love and acceptance and God has shown that to me and given that to me so that I can go and give these kids the same love and acceptance that they have always wanted to. Over time, I really do believe this classroom becomes a safe haven for them, a place where they feel accepted and they know they're gonna be safe and it's comfortable. I think God loves these kids so much, more than I could ever hope to love them. But I think He wants them to rest and to be happy. I think He wants to heal their hearts.
Every day they walk out of my classroom. And at the end of the year, they walk out of my classroom forever. It's so hard. It's hard not knowing what lies ahead for them or what type of choices they'll make. And I just have to rest. I've done everything I could do. I've loved them the best that I can. And my hope is that they'll figure out that God loves them so much more than I ever could. The values of the community that Lindsay works in are the values of the world. But the values that Lindsay lives by are the values of heaven. They're the values of Jesus. And if we'll make Jesus, not religion, but Jesus, the center of our lives, our lives will be changed into something far better. And our lives will become a blessing to the world that's around us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus took the way of sacrifice so that we could see how different life could be when it's lived with you as the center of our lives. Come to us today, O Lord, and make us mindful of your unconditional love for us. Give us the courage to invite you into our lives. Give us the courage to say, Lord Jesus, I know that I have been trying to push you away because I really didn't think I needed you in my life. But I'm convinced that if I have you living inside me and if your love is alive inside me, that my life is going to turn into what you always wanted it to be. And when it does, my life's going to be better than it could ever have been otherwise. So I'm asking you to come and forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for trying to push you away. Forgive me for trying to do life without you. Come and make your home in my heart and lead me from the inside out to become what you would have me be. Give us the courage to invite you into our lives today, O Lord, and help us to live for you from this day forward. Help us to travel the road of sacrifice. Help us to walk with you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. It was part of God's eternal plan A Savior who would come to live and die as one of us Death's battle to be won His light pierced through the dark And with passion in his heart he went the way of sacrifice, walked the road to Calvary. He went the way that proved his love, giving all for you and me. He went the way that no one dared, no one else could pay the price. He went the way that was his life, the way of sacrifice as he passed through timeless history he showed us what it meant to give up everything for love the reason he was sent it took his death to see what life could truly be. He went the way of sacrifice, walked the road to Calvary. He went the way that proved his love, giving all for you and me. He went the way 
that no one dared, no one else could pay the price. He went the way that was his life, the way of sacrifice. Jesus, our Redeemer, suffered in our place. Open wide the doors of heaven by the power of grace. He went the way of sacrifice, walked the road to Calvary. He went the way that proved his love, giving all for you and me. He went the way that no one dared, no one else could pay the price. He went the way that was his life, the way of sacrifice. He went the way that was his life, the way of sacrifice. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for worship. We are glad that you came to be with us. We hope that what we offer Jesus here today is something that was meaningful to you. If it stirred your heart and you have made a decision to give your life to Jesus Christ, we celebrate with you and we would like to know that. If you will write us an email, we will celebrate with you and, 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 and try to help you in the next steps. If you want to give your life to Jesus and you're not sure how, if you will write our church or write me personally, we will write you back and we will try to walk you through this process. If you would like to meet with us via FaceTime or Zoom, let us know that and we will be happy to try to meet with you as well. If you would like to be baptized into the faith, we're working on some plans to try to do that. We have had several people who have made professions of faith and we want to try to help you in this process. Baptism is a next step where we confess our faith to the world and we are going to try to work on an online system for doing that. If you will get in touch with us, we will try to help you in this process. If you want to join our church, and we hope you will, go to our website. You will find the forms for doing that. If you will fill those forms out and just send us a picture, we will celebrate with you as being a new member of our church, and we will do everything we can to try to help you in those next steps. God bless you for joining us here today. God bless you for joining Jesus. God bless you for loving Christ and for wanting to follow him. And let us know if there are things you need in this extraordinary time. And we will try our very best to help you and to meet those needs if we can. Now may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace this day and every day now and forevermore. Amen.